Jared, take it away. Cool. Um, you can hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Um, yeah, so my name is Jared Salikin. Um, I've actually known Jessie like my entire life. I don't remember ever not knowing her. And so I'm um, super excited to be here. And uh, yeah, I guess just to share a little bit more about my story. And um, hopefully it's helpful in some way, shape or form. So um, I love question and answers at the end, so um, I'm going to open that up. I'm pretty much an open book, so whatever you want to ask afterwards, I'm more than okay with. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, to start off a little bit about who I am, so born and raised here in Calgary. Um, haven't had an interesting journey, call it, uh, kind of all over the place. Really uh, started at Mount Royal, went to school for a Bachelor of Science, um, did a chemistry degree, realized about halfway through I was never going to use it. Um, which is always fun when you're doing a degree, um, spending thousands of dollars. But um, essentially while I was there, I'm sure a few of you guys have probably heard of student painting companies. I ended up doing that for four years. Um, so did my own, my own little company for two years, um, then got promoted, was a district manager. So essentially for my last two years while in university, I was in charge of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, teaching other students like how to run their own little businesses, doing commercial, residential work, stuff like that. Um, getting ready to graduate. I, on a whim, so, like still had no idea what I wanted to do, kind of wanted to get out of painting, um, and then randomly just signed up for this mentorship program at Mount Royal. Um, got paired up with this guy and just did a whole bunch of random shit with him. So <laughs> like literally started with doing uh, beer gardens and then I ran like a cold pressed juice company and then a healthy meal, um, meal prep and delivery company. Um, and then he actually wanted to start a restaurant and so we ended up buying a food truck I ran that for a little bit and then uh, my claim to fame for the construction industry is one day he came up to me and he was um, essentially just asked me like do you want to be in charge of building out this restaurant and I was like well I have no fucking clue what I'm doing but like if you're okay with that then sure um, and yeah so essentially was acted as the GC for a half a million dollar project, um, quite literally took it from a concrete slab to a fully functioning restaurant, somehow ended up like getting it on budget, on time, um, almost killed myself in the process. I was doing 12 to 16 hour days every single day, kind of like 80 to 100 hour work weeks. Um, finally got to that, was completely burnt out, got it open, got all the inspections passed, and then of course our GM quit a weekend. And so I was like, oh, so we knew, we did say you were gonna have a couple weeks off, but uh, we kind of need you to run this restaurant now. Um, had quite literally never worked in a restaurant in my entire life. I mean, I've eaten at restaurants, that's about the extent of my experience. And so, um, yeah, I kind of just fumbled my way through that. Um, essentially took that from quite literally zero in revenue to um, just over two million in yearly revenue um, in about two and a half years and then started to get bored because we had kind of promoted some people. Um, they took over a lot of my roles and you know it was great I could delegate to them but I always like to be doing something and so um, essentially he same guy asked me to join his tech startup here in Calgary um, became the chief growth officer for that, was in charge of sales and marketing. Um, did that for about a year and then ran into my quarter life crisis and kind of blew my life up. And uh, that's where I am today. <laughs> so um, kind of talking about a quarter life crisis, what led to that was a little bit of the beginning was probably about four or five years ago, I actually started seeing a therapist. Um, could just kind of feel that something was wrong. Something was off, something I couldn't really take care of everything myself I needed some help and so I started seeing her see, saw her for a couple of years um, got to the point where I was like okay I kind of want to expand my horizons a little bit you know do something different um, whatever it might be and so one day randomly saw a little bio on Instagram on somebody and he had an organization called the Kings of Hearts and they talk about like modern masculinity and mental health and stuff like that and um, saw they were doing a meetup and so decided to go and attend essentially and went by myself didn't know a soul that was going and in my mind kind of just went worst case scenario I'll lose an hour of my life and um, but yeah so I went to that actually ended up loving it it was for the first time in my life realized that other people struggled with the same kind of things that I did um, and then really liked it went to a couple of those became close with the founders of that and they started talking to me about um, they're starting a men's group 
and they said, you know, it's kind of similar to this, a little bit more in depth. And so it was a closed group. That one was just guys, and we really kind of go into the shit on that. And um, because it's the same guys over and over, you build a relationship with them, and it's more specific to you. Instead of these general topics, general discussions, you know, kind of in an open room, we really go into specifically what's going on with you. So all that kind of culminated in this feeling of having a really big disconnect between the outer perception of my life and the inner reality of, you know, on the outside, it looked like I was doing great. I was, you know, successful. I was like, you know, a part owner of a restaurant at 25 and, you know, an exec at this, you know, tech startup. And um, I got to essentially travel the world with that tech startup for free because I was kind of the traveling sales guy. And so like I did New York twice, Vegas twice. I went to Dusseldorf, Germany. I did a month in Dubai. I did London, England, all within a year. Um, and so everyone, you know, would say, oh, like you're so lucky and all of that. But on the inside really felt that I was essentially completely empty and didn't feel fulfilled at all. And quite literally like sad slash depressed. And so that really kind of led to realizing that I really needed a change. And I think for me, a big part of it was not understanding why I do a lot of things. And I'd always had this like weird drive within me to, you know, like succeed or, um, you know, just to be like a high earner or whatever it might be to have people like me. And I never really knew where that came from. I tell myself like, oh, that's just what I want to do. I want to be successful, whatever successful means, right? Um, and then realizing, you know, after doing some of this work on, you know, myself of, oh, it's actually trying to fill this need of me not feeling worthy of this stuff and not feeling worthy of, um, you know, the attention or worthy of doing good or that I had to be a better version of myself to be essentially like worthy of love. And so had that huge realization and it kind of came down to realizing that I was afraid to be seen and like afraid to be seen for my authentic self. And really that's kind of what led to the, one of the big changes. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about was I've gone through a, a huge number of changes in my life, but um, especially, you know, being in groups or environments or organizations, just because you're changing doesn't mean that the people around you are going to change and doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to accept the changes from you. Um, so where this came up in my life was essentially, you know, the guy that I was doing all of these different, uh, you know, businesses with, and we kind of turned into like essentially best friends. Like he was the closest person to me for my, in my life for about three years. I was super close with his family. Like, you know, his kids called me uncle Jared, like, very, very close. And he was one of the first people that I opened up to um, about this and kind of said, you know, like I was afraid of showing my authentic self um, of, you know, kind of putting my ideas out there for fear of being rejected from it. Very supportive at the fir at first from him, but, um, you know, kind of different once things actually started happening. And I felt like I had my own voice and I wanted to, you know, implement some of my strategies, some of my plans, the way that I thought the things should go. Um, it kind of led to this point where uh, we kind of got into it a little bit one day, um, disagreed on something. And, you know, with me changing almost the rules of the relationship where it wasn't just whatever he wanted to do now and really kind of trying to make it a true partnership, it led to a lot of friction. And after that, he quite literally said um, to me, essentially verbatim was, I don't know if I like the authentic you which fucking sucked <laughs> and hurt for sure. Um, but looking back on it, really what, I'm, what I tried to take away from that is the positives of realizing what the environment that I was actually in, the true environment, not what it looked like, not what it appeared to be, and realizing that that was the environment I'd been in and quite literally that's probably the environment I would have been in for several years after that if that wouldn't have happened. And even though it sucks at some times, but um, kind of accepting this idea of the short-term pain for the long-term gain of you being your authentic self and, you know, speaking your truths and, you know, not just going along with whatever anybody's saying, really what it does is it exposes the truths of people and the truths of your environment that you're in, whether that be your company, your boss, your family, your friends, your parents, whatever it might be. And really just trying to accept that and integrate that into my entire life because 
just knowing that it's better to have the truth than kind of living in that ignorance for the entire time. So um, when I say I blew up my life, um, you know, what that meant was a lot of different things. Essentially what I did was I walked away from everything I was involved in. With me, because I'm, I worked so much, of even when I wasn't doing those 80 to 100 hour work weeks, I was still at least in there 60 hours a week. And, you know, essentially a lot of my personal relationships were also tied up in there. A lot of my friends became, you know, my colleagues because that's where I was spending all of my time. So it was walking away from them. It was a big financial decision because essentially what it had led to of, um, call it shaky business, um, foundations of me destroying my credit, maxing out every single credit card I had, and essentially putting myself $100,000 in debt, and at the same time not getting anything in writing, and so having no guarantee that I would be able to recoup any of that at all. Um, so it was a huge decision for me of, you know, if I walk away from this, I could potentially lose all of that essentially overnight. But there was something inside of me that just did not allow me to go back, that the thought of, of doing that really just destroyed me inside. And it was one singular moment that I remember very specifically. I, was, I turned into a shitty employee. Like, I'm not going to lie. I was sitting there. I knew that I didn't want to do this anymore. And I would spend all day just kind of reading newsletters, like not really doing anything. And one day I just kind of looked over and I went, oh, this is how people lose 10 years of their life. You know, kind of getting into that routine of, well, this is comfortable, I'm gonna make the best of whatever this situation is, I don't wanna rock the boat, and realizing that you know, I could wake up 10 years from now, be exactly where I am today, and still be absolutely miserable. And so that's really when I decided to kind of walk away from it. Um, what that meant was I had to be very practical about it. You know, the first thing that I had to do was find a job to pay the bills. Um, I, I, want, I knew that I wanted to work on some side projects and, you know, kind of explore what I actually liked doing. And that with that, I needed some flexibility. And so I applied at a restaurant, got a job, um, essentially as a glorified busboy, uh, service assistant. And in my mind to get through that, the story I had to tell myself was quite literally, um, I romanticized it in my brain. And I would be there and I'd be cleaning tables and I'd go, this is gonna be such a good story one day. Of He went from restaurant owner to bus boy and then whatever I'm gonna do in the future. It'll be a great story and that's what it was able um, to get me through it. Um, after about a month and a half of that, you know, I started bartending, serving, um, and essentially that's what I'm still doing today. Now, on the flip side of it, I also knew that I really wanted to push myself into areas and to do things that I have not done before. Um, what this, ended up happening was, again, this realization that the thing I was afraid of most was essentially to be seen, to be seen for who I actually am. And the tricky part about it, though, was that I realized it was also the thing I wanted the most in my entire life, was to be seen to have the spotlight, not of fame necessarily, but of attention put on me. Um, however, and so I spent my whole time seeking for that, you know, that spotlight, that attention, but whenever that would come on to me, um, I would feel so uncomfortable and so scared that I would just automatically shove it away, um, do whatever it would be to get out of that and then long for it again. So being a little bit of an extreme person, I went, what can I do to force myself to really, you know, be in that spotlight? And I went, okay, well, I'll start a podcast and I will make the commitment to myself to be as vulnerable, as authentic as I possibly can be and to speak about things that are really, you know, tough on me and things that I've really struggled with. Um, now going into that, like I was scared shitless to, to post anything and to do any of it. And what's really helped me and I've been able to adapt it for a lot of other areas of my life is a shift in perspective. Um, because a lot of times for me, I'm very bad at putting a ton of pressure on myself. And so going into it, I'm like, essentially, if it's not worth it, if it's not like a top 100, if I don't have millions of people, if everyone doesn't love it, whatever it might be. And that pressure was almost crushing. And I realized I did that in all other aspects of my life as well. Um, and so I was able to really take it down a notch and put the perspective on it of if I was able to talk about something um, you know, that helped even one person and helped change their life, it was worth it. it. Nothing else mattered. Bringing it back down to that simple of even helping one person and making them feel like they're not alone 
um, and letting them know that other people struggle, um, you know, with a lot of the things that we all struggle with. And really where this kind of came into play was um, in joining that men's group, I became very, very close with them and, um, you know, shared some of my deepest, darkest secrets and, you know, them to me as well. And I would look at these guys and see, you know, I, I viewed them as strong and, um, you know, capable and emotionally intelligent and all these things. And I really kind of looked up to a lot of them. And then one day having, you know, the extreme example of finding out that several of them had either planned their own suicide or actually attempted suicide before that. And really bringing it literally back to that of like, wow, you know, a lot of that pressure comes from feeling alone and putting that pressure on yourself. And so I'm going to take that as my goal, as my driving force of if I help even one of them, it's totally worth it. And, you know, thinking about even things like this and, you know, I, I imagine, I don't know, you know, any of you except Jesse, but, you know, imagining that you're very driven and that, you know, you see these problems within the industry and, you know, you want to make these lasting changes to the industry, which is amazing. And, you know, just kind of bringing that conversation back to making sure that you don't crush yourself under your own pressure of if you're able to even make, you know, it better or make it so that someone doesn't have to go through the same things that you went through. Um, even if you're able to do that just for one person through the work that you're doing, it's worth it that it doesn't have to be every single one of these meetings. It's going to change the world. It's going to change the entire industry, um, whatever it might be, even if it makes it better for one person, in my view, it's completely worth it. So the other thing that really kind of stood out to me as I started going into some of these topics, um, exploring some of, you know, the things that I viewed about my life and the decisions that I made about my life, one of the big ones that it came back to was, you know, this idea of the shoulds. And I, I talk about a bunch of different topics, but um, this kind of, this idea kept coming up over and over and over and over again, these shoulds. And so one of the things I go into is modern masculinity. You know, the idea that, um, you know, a lot of times, and it's very, you know, it's a big topic in our culture right now is, you know, things like toxic masculinity. And why is that coming up? Why do men act the way that they do in certain times? And, you know, especially in, you know, construction and a male dominated, um, you know, industry, I imagine it comes up a ton. And for me, it goes back to the shoulds. And what I mean by that is, you know, from the moment that you're a young boy, you're told that men should act this way. These are the feelings that you should feel, that you're allowed to feel anger and nothing else that you know, you're relied upon, but you're not able to open up to other people. Um, this is how you act, this is how you feel, this is how you should look. You know, some of the other ones are career path is a big one. Um, the shoulds of, you know, your role should look like this, you should have this title by this age, this is what your work-life balance should look like. Um, this is how much money you should be making. Um, even in your life path, like for me, I know it comes up a lot in kind of our parents' generation. What I was told, you know, for my entire life is that the path that you're on and that you should strive to hit is, excuse me, you go to school, you get a good job, you get married, you buy a house, and then you work to retire. And from a very young age, I fought against that. I'm like, well, that's not what I want. Like, what if I want to be fulfilled? What if I want to enjoy work? Like, no, 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 you shouldn't like work. Work is to pay the bills. You, sh you work for your retirement and challenging that idea. Um, and even things like self-care, right? You know, there's, for, for me, it's, I feel like everyone's coming at me of, you should meditate every day. You should journal every day. You should go for a walk every day. You should um, exercise every day. And none of these things in themselves are inherently bad. The problem that I have with shoulds is that each person is an individual and it's not a one size fits all. It's not that, you know, for you to feel better, for you to work on your self care, you have to do it this way. Um, you know, I've tried all of those and some of them work. And for me, I like meditating when I'm in the mood to meditate, but if I force myself to meditate, it actually goes against, um, I, you know, it has the opposite effect. Uh, another one that I, t I think a lot about is active rest of, you know, a lot of times we feel like we're burning out. We feel like we're getting to this point where we can't push anymore. And we, we almost feel that shame of like, no, I should keep going. I need to keep doing more. I need to do more. 
or okay, I'll take this day off. But the whole day you're just in your head worrying about what you're not getting done, that I'm going to be so far behind. Um, for me, it's, you know, the idea that even sometimes taking that one step backwards or, you know, taking that one day off where instead of trying to be at 50% for an entire week, you know, you're at, you're able to take that one day off. And even though you only work five days that next week, you're at 90%, right? And just taking that back and taking that pressure off and the shoulds, because a lot of times where I feel like those shoulds come from is actually trying to appease others of trying to fit into their mold, trying to fit into, you know, what you should be doing. And this is what society tells you is the way that you should be acting and whatever it might be. And a lot of times I feel like that burnout comes from because you're doing things that you think you're supposed to be doing instead of things that you actually want to be doing that you have to put so much more mental energy into it because it's not that you actually think that it's right or you're not think or it's not necessarily aligned with you but I should be doing this and therefore I'm going to push myself to do it um, or on the flip side the other thing that I've seen over and over again is again that idea of you know wasting 5 10 20 years of your life because that's what everyone told you you should be doing um, and realizing that you've hated it the whole time. And you know, it's, you don't have that payoff at the end. And I think that was one of the things that stood out to me the most was as I started looking at you know, my motivation behind doing things, it was when I achieve this, I'll be happy. When I do this, like, that'll be enough. And every single time I hit one of those, those uh, milestones, I realized that I didn't feel different at all. And um, that's really where I came back down to because I realized I was doing it for other people and not for myself. It wasn't that I thought that that's what I actually want. Um, it's not that that was actually fulfilling. I thought that that would, that would gain me those approval, that worthiness from other people. Um, so kind of my two major thoughts that you know, I wanted to kind of get off on you know, coming in here today. Um, was one for me, I think about change a lot. I'm like, how do you actually create real change? And for me, I don't think that it's grandiose, you know, these huge life altering singular events. I don't think that that's how you actually cause change. I think that it's consistent daily interactions with yourself and others, constantly trying to get better slowly but surely, consistency over one big splash. Um, you know, the idea that by changing one person's opinion at a time or by affecting somebody positively one person at a time, it builds that momentum, almost like the avalanche, you know, at the beginning of the mountain, the top of the mountain, it's only a little snowball, but at the end, it's half the mountain that's come down. And starting with that and celebrating those little wins, those little pieces, and whether that's just, I had a good day today or... You know, I, I helped educate somebody today on, you know, why that might not be appropriate, whether they took it or not. There might be other people around them that are looking and you might not see those little ripples, but they really do, um, you know, they really do build up. The other big thing and something that was really tough for me to kind of accept and to, um, you know, internalize was by doing things for yourself by putting yourself in a better position, by working on yourself and making sure that you're happy first, um, you know, by filling your cup before you fill others, it actually allows you to be more impactful for those people around you. It allows you to help them more. By you being in a good place, you'll have more effect on them. And I think that there's a lot of negative connotation around this idea of being selfish, right? That you need to take care of yourself um, is a bad thing that you always put other people first. But, um, you know, if you're pouring from an empty cup, you can't help anybody around you. And you'll be so much more impactful um, when you're good and when you're happy with yourself and when you're feeling fulfilled. So um, those were the main points that I wanted to talk about. Um, thank you so much for letting me rant for a little bit. Um, like I said, I love, uh, you know, questions, uh, whatever you want to ask, like literally about anything about, um, you know, masculinity, toxic, you know, toxic masculinity, mental health, um, you know, entrepreneurship, um, like literally how long I've been growing my hair for, it really doesn't matter to me. Um, I'm an open book. And so, yeah, I'd just love to continue the conversation, whether it's here or afterwards. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jared. Um, there was a lot of things on there that I didn't even know about you. And
Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Is the uh, podcast still going? Podcast is still going, yeah. Still going strong. Uh, 